Many facets of healthcare have been in the news recently, not the least of which is the exciting expansion of health coverage for thousands of Montana citizens. We have uh, an esteemed panel this afternoon, and our moderator will introduce each of the members of the esteemed panel. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator, who will have a few comments as well, John Goodnow, the CEO of Benefis Healthcare. See, I got, I got thrown off right away when you said esteemed panel, and then we were, we were thinking there was a whole nother panel. <laughs> so it, it's great to have you all here in Great Falls, and I'm really appreciative to Webb and the, and the chamber that, uh, that this event's in Great Falls this year. So thanks for being here, and good to see you all. I tell you, one of the things, um, one, my favorite healthcare speaker in the country, by the way, is Nate Kaufman. And I think Nate does a really good job, and I agree with many of his points. And one of the big things I agree with is that American healthcare is broken. And one of the parts that make it most broken is that our healthcare system is just way too expensive. And we have to do things to redesign American healthcare system and healthcare in Montana, even though I will tell you this, Montana is the 49th lowest in the country for outpatient charges and costs and the 50th lowest for inpatient. So as the states go, we're doing a pretty good job. But that doesn't mean that Montana is still not too expensive, and we are. So we got to get the cost of American health care down and make it more sustainable over time. And that's going to take a lot of different efforts. And one of the important efforts for doing that is to make sure people have coverage and to get cost shifting out of the system and so forth. And so the, the Montana Help Act, which was, was passed in the last legislative uh, session. Thank God for Senator Buttrey and all of his efforts and, and the cooperation with the governor's office and people from throughout the legislature. But that's a major deal for Montana, and it'll actually be kicking off on uh, January 1st, of course. People are already getting signed up for it. So we're going to talk a bit today about that some more, and Senator Buttrey and Tara Vizi are going to do that part. And then as we start getting more people covered, of course, one of the things we run into here in Montana is the whole point about workforce in Montana and making sure that we have an adequate workforce. And um, as the governor mentioned, health care is already the biggest single employer in the state of Montana and growing. And so we're going to have to get more workforce development going. And so Pam's going to talk about that. And she'll do a great job. And we're going to talk about some of the kind of unique approaches we have to developing more healthcare workforce in, in Montana going forward. And then the bonus session that was mentioned earlier today will be about the potential of Montana getting its own medical school. And Dan Burrell and Dr. Robert Hasty will be presenting at probably around 4 today and then taking questions after their presentation. So that kind of fits nice into that, too. And then uh, if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit more about the health and wellness, Ken, that, uh, that was part of the governor's Main Street Montana project and that he mentioned a little bit earlier and some of the recommendation areas that we came up with recommendations for the governor in. So, but I'll, I'll save that to the end. And with that, we'll start off with uh, Senator Buttrey. You want to start? Uh, sure, John. Thanks. I am a little bit confused, though. After Mr. Kaufman's presentation, I thought I was here to present on my Uber bill. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, would you rather hear about the Uber bill? <laughs> okay. Well, I was asked to speak today, and thank you for the invitation, on a couple different things dealing with the HELP Act. And the first part was the process of finding a solution. Second, secondly was what is different about our solution? What makes our solution uniquely Montanan? And third, what do we believe the HELP Act will accomplish? So to go back a little bit in history and into this um, previous 2015 legislative session, the good news is everyone was looking for a solution. 
and that was really good compared to the previous sessions where we really had two different solutions being offered and that was either pure expansion using the ACA or the other side of the coin was just to make sure everything died that had anything to do with the ACA. Well, in this session, legislators from both parties realized we had to have a solution. The first solution that we had offered was from Governor Bullock's camp, and that was a innovative solution using a TPA, um, and that was uh, dispatched by the legislature. We then had a propo Republican proposal brought forth that was called the Big Sky Health Plan, and it dealt with four components, effective management, and all bills except one died, and the one that didn't die was a resolution, which is something we use to kind of feel good about ourselves, but it doesn't really do much. Second component was community mental health, and that was where we had great success. Representative Ron Eli, who may be here, he's speaking later, really championed that effort and uh, was amazed what he was able to do, passing four out of five bills that became law. The third effort was innovative reforms, and once again, the only thing that passed, everything died except the nursing licensure compact. Everything else was either dispatched by the legislature or through the executive. And the fourth thing that was important component for the Republican plan was coverage for Montana families. As Republicans, we understand that this coverage is important. We've just had a problem with how we get there. Unfortunately, in that category, everything also died. So we were having limited success in the legislative session in finding something that would work. So we needed a new approach. We needed something that we could all live with. So how do we find a solution? What was the process? The first thing that we had to do as we talked to different people, talked to organizations, to the public, to users, is we had to separate the ideology and rhetoric from fact. And one of the first things we ran into is we are over-dependent in the state of Montana and the federal government. And if we do anything as far as an expansion of health care, we're just going to make ourselves more dependent, even if it's just short term. And that was something that we all struggled with. Why are we so dependent on the federal government in Montana? Well, we're one of the largest states. We have a lot of roads and a lot of infrastructure, and we couple that with number two, which is we have one of the lowest populations. Our low population cannot afford to pay for our roads and that infrastructure. We need help from the federal government, or else we would, none of us would be able to afford to live here with the taxes that we'd have. The third reason why we're so dependent on the federal government is because we have one of the highest percentages of people that are living in poverty. So the choice is we can stand up and we can complain about our dependence on the federal government or we can actively make a choice to try to do something about it. And that thing that we can change is the number of people living in poverty. Second thing was we had to get real data on the users of Montana's current Medicaid system because there's a lot of misconception out there about the system, how many users are, how much it's growing, why it's growing. So we looked at everything from Healthy Montana Kids, which is the biggest growth area, and we looked at things like Family Medicaid and TANF, and we actually saw reductions. We had to spread that, that data around so people had the right data versus the ideology. We had to dispatch with a fiction that poor people want to remain poor. They want to remain unhealthy, and they want to remain living off of the government. And I was surprised how much we heard that. And we had said, we can't believe that. As legislators, we're looking for a solution. We have to dispatch that. We have to know that people who will get healthy and off, people will not get healthy or off addictions without regular and preventative care. We had to realize that the real entitlement exists today. If someone that's low income is sick, they typically wait till they become chronic or very sick and they go to the emergency room. They can't be denied that service. That's the entitlement today. They're getting the wrong help at the wrong time and in the most expensive fashion. It's something we had, to, we had to deal with. We had to look at what the costs were of the chronic people and the addictions that we have in our state. And we had to look at how much Montana spends on the ACA right now, which we know is somewhere between four hundred dollars and $600,000 a day that we send out of the state, and what's happening with that money, certainly not coming back and working for Montana. So we looked at, at getting facts out there. We also then had the advantage, because we're so late in the process, that we were able to look at other states and find out the ones that had expanded, especially the other six that had used innovative waiver processes, how's it working for them? Um, and and we, we all know, we hear the articles, and I, oh, five minutes, thank you, I'll speed it up. <laughs> what I want, what we had to stop doing is looking at one side of the p and I'm a businessman, I look at the p and so we, we there, I'll give you a specific state where they anticipated 140,000 people would sign up in the first fiscal year and 300,000 people signed up. If you look at half of that P&L, you're saying their expenses are out of control. We have to look at the revenue side. 
That's great. So it's more expensive because more people signed up. But getting those people healthy, getting them jobs, getting them to pay taxes, to buy homes, getting them more productive, taking care of their families, financially independent, we have to look at all the data because in my business, if I spend more next year, but I have more revenue because of what I spent, that's a good thing. So we had to take on that business aspect of looking at it. And most importantly, we had to tie health care to economic development. That was what was most important to me. To me, the HELP Act is simply a big economic development program. It recognizes that if people aren't healthy or they're addicted, they're not going to be able to work. They're not going to get promoted. They're not going to become financially independent. They're going to remain a burden on themselves, their family, and our state. And we had to address that. So how is our solution unique? We tie health care to economic development, and I'm thrilled about that. We focus on personal responsibilities. All parties pay for their health care to the extent that federal law allows. We redirect parties with assets to pay more or to purchase private health insurance. We don't allow for do double coverage. Those folks being serviced by Medicare or other traditional Medicaid or other programs, they stay on it. We don't move them off of their current program onto ours. We provide for collection of premiums, and we disenroll those folks that don't pay. It's part of the personal responsibility. We provide incentives for veterans, students, and people that practice healthy behaviors. We provide for a more stable and reliable workforce and a pathway for people to financial independence. We include significant health care and tort reforms designed to reduce the cost of health care for all users of health care. And we designed our plan to be adaptable to changes in the ACA. Um, I'm one of those folks that hope that there are extreme changes. I think there has to be in the ACA. We didn't want to have a plan like other states that when things change at the federal government, poof, our plan goes away. We've made it adaptable. And our goal is to get enough people out of poverty so that the money that's paid into the system by Montanans equals the money that's used by Montanans. We're revenue neutral. We're not depending on anybody. And we're getting a healthier population. And we're collecting a lot of data in the bill to make sure we do that. So bottom line. What do we think the HELP Act will accomplish? It's going to increase the availability of high quality health care to all Montanans, provide greater value for tax dollars spent on the Montana Medicaid program, work to reduce health care costs for all, encourage Montanans to take greater responsibility for their health care and their personal success, reduce cost shifting for un unreimbursed health care costs to those patients that have health insurance plans, and provide a pathway out of poverty for our poorest citizens. And my last comment, which I think is one of the most exciting, is that our solution that so many people in this room worked on is being hailed as one of the most innovative solutions in the entire country. That means Montana is setting the standard. And I hope other people are listening. What we did is we set politics aside to find a solution to a complex problem. It's called working together. We refuse to submit ourselves to either a one-size-fits-all bill solution or to a no solution to bury our heads in the sand and just say we'll deal with it later and we stopped people we got to the point where we can stop blaming everyone else whether it's different political parties or providers or payers or patients and said we just need a solution bring everybody to the table give everybody a stake and i just i think it's exciting that in the state of montana we were the ones that stepped up and said let's get past this politics let's find a good solution something that we all give and take and that we're going to monitor and adapt and change and make very successful for the future. I probably talked too long, John. No, you did great. <laughs> so now you made our panel actually esteemed. See? Oh. So, that's good. <laughs> so I tell you, personally, I wished we could see the level of cooperation, collaboration between the parties and between the legislative and the executive branch that this demonstrated in Montana at the federal level. And, you know, I think the federal level could learn a, an example and a lesson from watching what happened in Montana. So speaking of uh, pleasure to work with, Tara Vizi is the governor's main health care person, and we work together on several things, and she is a delight to work with, a great person. And she'll give you some additional perspectives about the, the HELP Act and, and what it's going to do for our fine state and the people in it. So, Tara? 
Thanks, John. There are uh, two challenging things for me about following Senator Buttrey. One is just following Senator Buttrey. But the second for me is I always feel like I have whiplash at the end of it because I start nodding and then I'm like, oh, wait, stop nodding. <laughs> like, I agree. No, I don't agree. I agree. No, I don't agree, which I was thinking during your comments is exactly what bipartisan compromise looks like. Um, and it's figuring out the things that you have in common and can work toward, which is what um, Governor Bullock and Senator Buttrey and so many others who are in the audience, I saw Representative Cook walk in, um, did during this session. And I agree with John entirely that um, I will forever treasure uh, and honor the time I got have had to work on this issue because it's far too rare in this country um, to see a bunch of smart, passionate people who don't necessarily agree on some really fundamental things come together and put politics aside and get something done for the good of the people of Montana. And so we have much to be thankful for, for Senator Buttrey's leadership and many of you in the room. Um, as a result of that work, uh, I think we really have a historic victory uh, for the people of Montana, for hospitals, critical access hospitals. Um, and providers in this room. As the governor said, it's, it's really just the first step of the work that we have to do together, but it was a really critical and important first step. Um, Senator Buttrey is exactly right that we have a, a truly uniquely Montana solution. Um, that you hear that phrase thrown around a lot in Helena, uh, this truly was. Um, we are the first state in the country uh, who will do expansion under a third private third party administrator. Um, we are the first state in the country to have the unique combination of premiums and co-pays that are a part of our waiver. Um, and we're only the second uh, state in the country to allow disenrollment for people for failure to pay their premiums. Um, as the governor said, he, he certainly didn't agree with all of the provisions that were in the HELP Act. Um, but he recognized that coming together and everyone giving and taking, I think Senator Buttrey wanted some things that he didn't necessarily get, um, but, but to see this kind of compromise happen for the good and the benefit of all of our neighbors and um, all of our doctors and all of our hospitals, um, again, is a really great thing. Uh, there are challenges that come along with being unique as well. Um, and as many of my colleagues in the Department of Health and Human Services and in the Department of Labor and in others know, uh, when the legislators left town, um, they, they began the real work of making sure this happened for the state of Montana and for, for many of you and that the legacy of the leadership of the many organizations and many legislators and many hospitals that worked on this could come to fruition. Um, there may have been a couple of days that folks took off after the legislative session, um, but there weren't many. Uh, the, the first hurdle that we had to get over, as most of you are familiar, was getting a waiver to move forward with the provisions that were in the HELP Act. We had to get federal approval from CMS. Um, I will uh, shorten the history of, of that work with CMS and just say <laughs> that it was difficult. <laughs> um, there were very, very challenging conversations, and I think there were moments where there were probably doubts from people in this room that we would actually get the federal approval that we needed to move forward. But not only did we get it, we got it in record time. And that's really due to the leadership of Governor Bullock. He never talked, stopped talking to Secretary Burwell. He never stopped um, making the case for how important this was for Montana. And really, not just how important it was for Montana, but that it, as Senator Buttrey said, that it creates a path forward for some of the really difficult states that are remaining, that are trying to figure out a way to expand access to health care in their states. Um, so he asked two things of CMS, of Secretary Burwell. One is, um, you have to honor the compromise legislation that we came up with. Um, I, I'm not going to settle for less than that. We can talk about operational details, but you have to honor the compromise, even the parts that he didn't necessarily love the most. Um, the second thing he said is, we need to get this approved by November 1st of 2015, because we want to make sure that when people go um, on to the FFM during open enrollment, that they immediately know whether they qualify for uh, coverage under the HELP Act, in addition to finding out if they co uh, are covered under subsidies or tax credits on the exchange. It was really important to take account of the momentum that already goes around open enrollment to make sure that we could get the most information to the most people in the quickest amount of time. 
That meant that um, there's a 60-day public comment period on the federal level when a waiver is submitted and then 15 additional days that are necessary. The first possible day they could have approved our waiver uh, was November 1st, which was a Sunday, and they approved it on Monday, November 2nd, um, just on time. That's thanks to um, the countless hours and dedication and passion of workers at the Department of Health and Human Services. There are some of them in this room today, some of them are not in this room today. I encourage you, anytime you see any one of them, please thank them for their service to the state of Montana. It has been inspiring to watch, and very often they don't hear from folks unless something's gone wrong um, in the Medicaid program and the healthcare system, and a lot has gone right since the 2015 legislature left Helena. And so please join me in thanking them. So, but the waiver wasn't the only thing they had to deal with. Um, they also had to draft an RFP. They had to score an RFP. They had to award an RFP uh, for the third party administrator. They're working on finalizing the contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield right now. They had to draft and post and hold hearings on rules. Um, and let's not forget all of the systems and operational challenges that there are in getting a change like this operationalized in such a short amount of time. Um, we tend, again, to hear, th hear when things go wrong. Um, open enrollment uh, for the ACA uh, last year wasn't a huge success story, and it was plastered all over front pages of, news, uh, of newspapers. This year, um, during the first enrollment week for Help Act recipients in Montana, 5,500 people enrolled without much of a hitch. Um, and an additional 5,000 have enrolled since then. That means 10,500 of our neighbors, coworkers, family members, friends, um, now have the hope of access to healthcare that many of, many of whom have never had before. Um, and, and the work hasn't stopped since then. Now people are working overtime to make sure that come January 1, we have all of our IT systems and all of our operational systems in place, working very hard with Blue Cross Blue Shield, making sure that the data can transfer as necessary between DPHHS, Department of Labor, Department of Re Revenue, Department of Corrections, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. So again, just an incredible amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, um, but, but, I, but I hope they all know how thankful we are all for their work um, and how many lives are gonna be changed in the balance. Um, on outreach and enrollment, again, I mentioned we have 10,500 people that have enrolled in a little less, in a little over a month. Um, that's due to the work not just of folks at DPHHS, but really, again, many of the folks in this room. So you have the Primary Care Association, you have certified application counselors, you have navigators, you have hospitals like Benefice, like Billings Clinic, like others that are doing direct outreach to their patients and to their clients who they know might qualify and helping to make sure that that information and education gets out there to folks who need it. Um, before I finish, I'm, I'm now going on too long too, I, I just wanted to say a minute about um, this morning's talk. I think that I was thinking it's probably, that I don't know how many optimists are in the room and how many pessimists are in the room, but um, I tend to fall in the latter category. Um, so, and I was thinking it's probably a hard time to be an optimist in the world. Like there's just so, there's so many hard <laughs> challenges that we're facing and so few solutions that are easy and in front of us. Um, what, as monumental as the passage of the HELP Act was and all of the work that's gone to seeing it to fruition, I think it has a legacy beyond that, and that's a pretty big legacy by itself. And the legacy is um, a really, really diverse group of stakeholders came together, found a way to communicate, found a way to work together. Really diverse groups of legislators and the governor found a way to come together, to talk together, to trust each other enough to move forward with a plan where a lot could have gone wrong. There were a lot of reasons this act shouldn't have passed. There were a lot of reasons we shouldn't have gotten the waiver. There were a lot of reasons that open enrollment uh, November 2nd start date for applications shouldn't have happened. And we've found a way to get it done. And I think it leaves a legacy of a relational infrastructure between the people in this room that offers a lot of hope forward in addressing the kinds of challenges that Mr. Kaufman identified this morning. Um, and it's a privilege to work with you all and the governor on that.
Thank you, Tara. And as we, those 10,500 and lots more to follow, as they become insured on January 1st and thereafter, you know, people will seek health services that they postponed in the past. So it's going to further exemplify the demand for health care workers in Montana. And um, already Montana, throughout the state, in a number of different different fields within the healthcare profession has shortages right now. So this whole workforce development arena is a really important thing going forward. And so um, I had the pleasure of being asked to serve on the Governor's Main Street Montana project in the Health and Wellness Key Industry Group. And we were asked to advise the governor come up with recommendations in different areas for um, health care improvement. And that's, and I'll talk a minute more about that at the end, but um, what that gave me the opportunity to do that I'd never really got to do before, too, was get to work with Pam. And uh, it was a, a delight to work with her, and she did a great job and really has helped the health and wellness Ken immensely. And um, I, I want to tell you how pleased I am to get to introduce her to talk to you more about our workforce development opportunities and uh, systems that we're pursuing in Montana. Thank you. So um, I didn't get to go to all these meetings with Senator Buttry and Tara every day. Um, and as a matter of fact, every time I would see them, I thought, I am just so thankful this isn't my issue, that I'm not having to do this. Um, but actually when the dust all settled and the final agreement was done there was a very significant workforce development portion added to montana's help act um, and interestingly um, that was added and the legislature left town um, not giving my agency money um, <laughs> to implement this plan um, but very kindly saying we could spend more of our own money if we needed to um, and I want to tell you why that wasn't a problem and why I think um, it was such an innovative idea to add this to um, Montana's Medicaid expansion law. And I want to do that by just using some data. That's another fabulous thing about my job. I'm surrounded by economists, and so I get handed all kinds of data all the time. Um, and I encourage you all, especially you, to look at um, our website and particularly the economy at a glance that comes out monthly because it usually is filled with data, especially data that's relevant to healthcare. But one of the most important things that we have been talking about nonstop since we issued the Labor Day report um, in September is that, um, and you all know it, you've heard it, but we're facing a worker shortage. In the next four years, about 130,000 people are going to retire um, out of our workforce system. And those are baby boomers who deserve to retire, and many of whom have put off retiring because they couldn't afford to because of the recession. Um, so it is time. But the simple fact is we have about 123,000 16 to 24-year-olds to fill all those slots. So even my very liberal arts education tells me that's not very good math. Um, we do not have enough people um, to fill those slots. Um, just the slots we already have, just the jobs that we currently have. And then the even better news is that we anticipate our economy to add about 6,500 jobs a year for the next 10 years. So we really do, not just in the healthcare industry, but in all of Montana, have to be really thoughtful about how we're going to fill that talent pipeline. And there's all kinds of incredible things going on. So Senator Buttrey couldn't have picked a better time and the Montana legislature to, to really think about how we get more people into our labor force. And what I keep telling people is the only people, the only human beings we can try to recruit back people back to Montana and I think we're doing a really good job of that. We've set up a website, we're reaching out, the universities are helping us reach out to people to try to recruit them back to Montana. Um, but I can tell you that hasn't been successful anywhere um, to the extent we need it to be. Um, so what we need to do is make sure that everybody in Montana is working to the top of their skill level and we're getting more people that currently live here upskilled and and working in our our system um, you've heard a lot about health care it is the largest employer in montana 
67,000 people in Montana in 2014. It's also the fastest growing industry in Montana at a rate of 2.8% for the last 10 years. Um, and that's job growth, not GDP. <laughs> so um, th it's the only industry in our state that grew during the recession. So the needs are fairly incredible, and I want to talk to you just a little bit about how we are working to meet those needs. You've heard both the governor and John mention the Main Street um, Montana project, um, and, and I want to tell you about it because it's done a lot of great things. But fundamentally for us, I think for us in state government, is we have 200 CEOs of every political persuasion from every industry sector talking to us regularly. And I think we've all learned a lot. So a lot of what you're gonna hear me and I think the governor over the next year talk about is how critical that communication is and how much um, we need your input. And I think, I think we have um, been able to talk about some really um, truly innovative things that the state and the university system are doing to meet industry's needs as well. So um, this is my little call to action. We can't get through this struggle, this challenge of filling our workforce pipeline without your help. Um, I think the university system needs it. I know the Department of Labor needs it. I know the Department of Health needs it. We need to learn what's happening, what you need. We need to understand it. And then we need you to understand what systems we're working with, what procedures we're working with, so that we know that we are exchanging information um, and really being responsive. And I think um, if I have anything to say about the Main Street Project, it has allowed us to do that um, in a formal and informal way. And I will be advocating to the governor and to everyone to keep that um, process in place so we're getting that information. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the intense collaboration with the Montana University system. Um, I don't know um, if any of you have had a chance to talk to your, uh, to your colleges, your, tri your tribal colleges, your community colleges in your region, but I would encourage you to do that because things really are changing. Um, they're hearing from me, they're hearing from you that things can't be the same. We can't, we don't have the time for people to take two and four and six years out of the workforce to get their training. So, yes, you can clap because that's true. Um, and they are doing everything in their power with a very, um, in place infrastructure to try to make that happen. You will see everywhere industry recognized credentials being embedded into college curriculums. You will see, hear colleges talk about short term training. And probably the most exciting thing that's happening is real collaboration for work based training. Um, and you can call it all kinds of things clinicals. Um, we finally have gotten hospitals to go, oh, that's work based training. There's all kinds of ways to do it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it is the way that states with small populations and small student populations and, uh, and trying to reach adult learners, it's how we can get them into the system and get them upskilled. So please talk to your colleges about what you need because I think you'll find them being a lot more responsive. Um, the governor mentioned the Healthcare Montana grant, $15 million healthcare grant. Um, the, I encourage you, if you don't know about it, to find out what's happened because just the work they've done on nursing curriculum and eliminating an entire year of training for an LPN, the very clear career pathway from CNA to RN that someone entering the healthcare um, workforce can see from the very moment they start. And if you're a single mom CNA and can see a pathway to become an LPN, becoming an LPN is a pathway out of poverty like no other. Um, you can support a family as an LPN. You cannot probably as a CNA or at least not long term. So it is a way to take your workforce where they are and those hospitals in rural Montana um, can tell you about this much more articulately than I can, but that's what they need to do. They need to be able to train those workers um, in Sydney, in Broadus, in Shoto, um, in Libby, 
and make sure that they can get nurses um, there. So I'm very excited. We also have a joint position. Um, we have brought on a person who is half funded by the MUS system and half funded by the Department of Labor to help facilitate accreditation, both for the on the job part and for the um, in the classroom component, the didactic learning. Um, and he is doing that daily. He's, he's getting um, work-based learning programs accredited. So again, a resource for you. And then just briefly, I will talk to you about the HELP Link program, which is the workforce development component of the HELP Act. Um, and that is a program that we have created using existing resources. Um, and we are creating a very individualized approach. We will be reaching out to every recipient um, of the HELP Act. We will be um, asking them to either online sign up, come into a job service office, or call a job service office. We will get them assessed. We will make an appointment with an employment specialist. When they come into the job service office to meet with that specialist, they will go through the assessment. All the barriers to employment will be assessed for them. They will be referred to services to address those barriers. And importantly, they'll be given correct regional labor market information about what are the in-demand jobs in that area, what training do you need, what are the employers that are doing that, and what are the opportunities to get on with those employers. Um, and it will be done in a local office where they know those employers. So we are poised to be ready to go. We have our IT systems communicating or uh, very close to communicating um, with DPHHS and all of our community partners because there are a lot of private providers that provide these services in the community as well. Um, so we're ready to go. We're ready to launch January 1st. Um, we encourage you to talk to folks about it when you're talking to um, uh, uh, Medicaid HELP Act recipients, um, encourage them to stop by their local job service office because just like the university system, I think they'll find it's a lot different than it was 10 years ago. I think there's a lot of shared knowledge and shared resources out there. So we're very, very excited to be a part of this, um, not just to help the individuals, but because it is critical to Montana's economy that we get these folks into the workforce um, as smoothly and efficiently as possible. So it's a really fun time to be doing this kind of work. Thank you, Pam. So the one one statistic that I like too that I think is interesting, the crowd probably think interesting, is the statistic you share that we're already a, one of the more elderly states. But what will our rank be in 2020 for the oldest? You know, if you rank well, the states the for old. Well, we're the third oldest right now, and we probably will move into the second eldest. So we're we're old. <laughs> <laughs> We are old and getting older. Yeah, which, which fits into Pam's point about 130,000 retirements coming up. And then on the, the workforce side of it, you know, quite a few of those are in the healthcare industry. So the more people we can get into healthcare, and since we're all getting old, we need more people to go into healthcare and take care of us. So that's a good deal. And, you know, another kind of plug for healthcare, I think. And to Tara's point about, geez, it must be hard to be optimistic about health care, I think we're in the best time ever to be in the health care field. We have a chance to do something, to make things better, to improve an entire industry. It's an exciting time to be in health care. It's a great place to encourage your kids and friends and others to go into. We have a great partnership with MSU here in Great Falls, and they do tons of health care programs. Some of them, you know, take quite a while to get your training. Others don't, but it's a great field. And so I think that's the other part of it is we just need to talk up the health care field as an industry and, you know, get more people interested into going into health care too. The other side of the the of the retirement thing that I think is kind of an interesting statistic is over the next 10 years, we're looking at just in the doctor rank, 750 doctors retiring in Montana. So a lot of folks there too. So let me tell you just a little teeny bit about uh, the kinds of recommendations that are begin going to be coming out of the health and wellness, Ken, of the Governor's Main Street Montana Project. And uh, Ken is 
key industry group. It took me a few meetings to just figure <laughs> that part out. But um, so there, we we came up with recommendations in five key areas, and these aren't the the actual recommendations are still in kind of the development phase for the committee to go through and the chair and vice chair to look at and so forth. But then they will be posted on the Main Street Montana website here in the not too distant future. Plus, we have to present them to the governor before they get posted, but um, it, that's coming up soon. But there, there's going to be recommendations in five areas. And, you know, you'll recognize a lot of these areas kind of tie into the whole conversation today. And back on Nate's point on cost, six of our recommendations are in the area of controlling costs in health care in Montana. So that, that was a fairly big area. Uh, again, the thing that Nate mentioned that's pretty lacking in American health care systems, kind of coordination of quick care, and that we had three recommendations in, in that arena. And then um, the whole area of preventative care, which we don't do a great job of in the United States and here in Montana, we had five recommendations in that area. And then kind of back to Pam's area, we had the most recommendations of all areas in the workforce development area. We had nine recommendations there. And then another area that ties into PAM is the whole area licensing boards within the states, within the state, and we had six recommendations in that area. So I think the, the group did a really nice job. I think there's some good recommendations coming out of that. And as, as was mentioned by Tara, that's an, and, and Pam both, that's an important effort to have you know, industry and government talking more. And so, you know, I applaud the governor's effort to create more of that through the Main Street Montana project. And I think all of those key industry groups have been, probably been equally successful. I'm only familiar with the health and wellness one, but what a great effort and a good way for us to improve coordination between the private sector and governmental sector in Montana too. So with that, I will hush because I bet you you got some questions for our esteemed panel here. <laughs> Here's one right there. I think they probably want you to wait for the mic. <laughs> and then if you'd state, I think you want them to state their name too. Okay. Brent Gaylord from Pondray Medical Center in Conrad. Terry, you were talking about the uh, deadline coming up December 31st. Um, for enrollment, is that just an open enrollment that will continue on into next year, or is that a deadline until like October next year? Thank you so much for the question, because often in my enthusiasm for having gotten the waiver approved by open enrollment, I sometimes uh, unintentionally confuse the issue. So open enrollment for the FFM um, for most populations will close December 31st, but people can apply for the for HELP Act coverage any time throughout the year. It's continuous enrollment. Thank you very much for the question and opportunity to clarify. Way in the back. Well, I just oh. the you need to wait for the mic. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't control myself clearly. So, so the the open enrollment for the federally facilitated marketplace ends January 31st. Just want to be totally clear. January 31st. Thank you. I think we're way in the way in the back too. My name is Logan Tinson, and I'm an emergency department pharmacist at Benefis here. And so I have a couple of questions first before I pose my question. How many people have used a pharmacist at any point in their life or in the last year? Right? So my question to the panel and as well is why aren't, why aren't basically, how, are pharma, how do you view pharmacists? Pharmacists mostly right now are viewed in, as in a dispensary role, right? We see them in Walgreens, we see them in CVS, we see them behind the counter. However, pharmacy is trying to change that role. We're trying to be more active and be out into helping patients and changing things. So a thing that's going on at the national level is trying to change legislation to where pharmacists can be 
considered providers and help with that care. So as you, as you see, one of the things that we can look at doing to free up some of our providers is have pharmacists see those patients as well, help them with their chronic management of their meds to where they're not readmitted through our hospital system, keep them healthier on the outside. So my question to the panel is, how do you guys foresee pharmacists help act and forward? Well, I, you know, I mean, one of the things that was embedded in Nate's talk and that is a necessity in American healthcare is that there be more a team approach to patient care developed that involves more than just the, the, the provider, whether it's the, the physician or the nurse practitioner, but a, a team approach to care. And that's one way we, we will be able to better provide care at lower cost and, it, and help people gain and maintain health. So, and you said, how do, how do we view you, Solans? We like you. So. <laughs> and I would just add, in addition to team, I, I would also encourage you to get a team of your licensing boards <laughs> your pharmacy board, your medical board, all of those folks, I would start talking right now about those scope of practice kinds of issues um, because it, it can be done. It is done all the time. It's, it's painful often, but, but, it, but we do it. We work through it, but they, they are very significant issues to deal with. So, and I know they are. I'm, I'm hearing already a little bit about them. Um, but start getting together a team of those folks now um, to start talking about those scope of practice issues. I can tell you right now that there's a group of about 30 pharmacists from across the state that are starting to address this initiative to try and get things rolling in that direction rather than waiting for a national level to wait and see what's happening in Other questions? Here we go. I hate to ask two questions, but, and this one doesn't even really necessarily pertain to the health itself, but I would like to address it with Senator Fletcher, because he might be able to clear up. No, but it's on. It's on. It might be down. It says it's on. Yeah, I think the batteries are probably it. getting. <laughs> Smack it on the table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, no. no. Uh, Senator uh, correct me if I'm mistaken. Uh, I'm, I'm from Pondray Medical Center in Conrad, and we thought it would be nice if some of the paramedics coming back uh, could be made uh, so that we could have them learning the ambulance crews and stuff. And as I understand it, we run a cup against resistance from the state to try and make that happen. Because the state has been pretty So the people that you're talking about are coming back through the military? Yeah. Yeah, there was a bill that we passed in the 2013 session, and uh, it's probably something we need to readdress and look uh, about making it more comprehensive. But it was to allow the certification boards, licensing boards within the state to take military certifications and directly correlate that to the training requirements and testing requirements for either public or private certifications. So we opened that door to allow those boards to say, we now have the authority to look at their military experience and say, you're, you're qualified, here's your license. If that's not happening, I don't know that we made it quite broad enough. We focused on CDLs, we focused on some other areas, but as I recall, the law was written to say that these boards could just do that. Um, it, I certainly think that we should get with labor, and I'm sure Commissioner Busey is going <laughs> to respond to it. And if we need further clarification, I'd be happy to, to work on that effort. 
it's only smart. Yeah, no, and actually the law is plenty broad enough, and that is not the problem that we're having. The problem that has occurred is getting military records um, and, and tran translating military training into civilian training. And it seems ridiculous, but believe, we, we're sending people to national conferences. They have been working, on, I, I mean, I can't, it's hard for me to fathom why when they have actual curriculums and they hand out certifications, they can't get that to our licensing boards. But the licensing boards are very frustrated because they've been unable to get the information they need from the military and they'll tell you that they don't give it to us. Um, so what we've started doing to, to address this is taking, letting each individual military person get their own um, records because it's faster than, we're, we wanted to have this grand scheme of them sending us all of their training curriculum, but that's just not gonna happen. And the military is telling us that's not gonna happen for a considerable long time. So we're just having to take it on an individual basis. And it is successful in some ways. The problem with paramedics is you have, you have a couple licensing phenomenons going on there. But, but I will tell you, people have put an extraordinary amount of work into it. Um, in this state and we've had the trouble has been with the military branches um, so we're still working with them both the governor and the adjutant general and the and our two senators are working on that issue all the time yeah, well, we have, we have talked at length to senator tester and senator dane's office about this issue but we've also have met with with military personnel about it as well there a is there is also a tool and i don't know whether the state's using it we can maybe talk about it offline but there's a tool now that will take those military certifications and will translate them into civilian yeah, they, um and yeah, you know, we that use can, that as well if that but. can be helpful we need to use it thank you uh webb brown of the montana chamber and and part of the support of the chamber uh, in expanding Medicaid in Montana was accountability. So what are the measurements, what are the metrics that are going to be used to determine that this effort has been successful? I mean, there's a whole range, obviously. Enrollment is a big one right up front. How many people are actually going to enroll? Out of the 70,000 eligible, we know everybody's not going to because of stigma, because of other reasons. Uh, and then how many folks are actually finding work or improving their current career? What are the metrics and how are we going to know as we go forward that we're on the right track, that we're making progress, that we're doing the things that we all intended and wanted to do uh, start and, and even improving health conditions going forward? What, can, you, can you speak to the metrics and the measurements and accountability? Sure, there, there is uh, pages and pages in the bill that talks about what's statutorily required by law for data that we're going to collect and get from providers and payers and, and different organizations that we'll analyze and use to make recommendations back to the legislature and the executive. Uh, there is a help, what's called the HELP Act Oversight Committee. Uh, Mr. Goodenow is the chairman of it, and that is the role is to collect the data. You know, I've, I've, that's a question that comes up nearly everywhere I speak, and certainly we think about how many people are enrolling. But well, we also need to figure out how many people are coming off to the system because we've taken them out of poverty. It's not an easy task because we have a constant flow of folks in. We need to look at demographics for certain groups of folks like our American Indians. We need to find out how many people are taking advantage of the job training. Is it being successful? Is it working? Are we taking people out of poverty? We need to look at the issue of charity and uncompensated care. Find some way to measure the savings that the providers and doctors are seeing. And then we have to look and say, okay, how is that translating? Something the legislature is very interested in. How does that translate to the insurance policy holders? Because we're dealing with a lot of different entities. It isn't that every dollar of uncompensated care goes right to the policy holder, but we need to find out how that relationship is. So there's a lot of things that we'll measure. It's, it's almost limitless. It's what's beautiful about the bill in that we made it so adaptable. We made it understanding that we're not perfect and that we're going to have to come forth and change it in the future to make it better and better. And, and it's interesting, I, I talked in my speech about how other states are seeing the innovation that we've done and, and um, want to know more about it. While we were sitting here, I got a text from a senator in New Hampshire that would like mm. Representative Cook and I to come out and speak to them about the bill. And these, these are regular occurrences because people see, hey, it's adaptable, it's long living, and, and you're gonna collect data and make good decisions. 
Um, just to add to that, we we have reprogrammed um, our IT system to collect the data that the bill asked for. And again, I'm thrilled about it. I've wanted it's data that I've actually wanted since I've been in this position, but we will be collecting specific barriers to employment. We will align those with what services are being provided, and then we will track these people with actual UI wage data. So we will know how much money they're making, and we will follow them for five years out. Any other questions? John, if there's not any other questions, I think we should acknowledge this has blown my mind away. First of all, the economic development component was so important to me and the efforts that government and, and the governor and his staff have taken to realize that jobs and workforce have to work hand in hand. You don't have successful health care without work and you don't have successful work without health care and I think that's admirable. But when we talk about government and how slow government traditionally moves and to look at what's happened in the past few months within government in the state of Montana to incorporate this in January 1st I think is incredible and my hats are off to all the folks here that work in state government that you've you've disproven the the uh, rhetoric that we all say and that's that government can't move fast you, you indeed have and I thank you that's a great point Well, we do have something for all of our panelists. We thank you very much for being here. It, it's an exciting story, something homegrown, wonderful to always hear about, and to hear about collaboration. And thank you, Senator Buttry. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Pam. And thank you, John. Absolutely.